OK, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the Science Needs Assessment Workshop. Um, before we get going, um, Edmund, are, you, are we OK on your end to, to kick this off? Yes, we are ready to go. Thanks. OK, for great. Great, thanks. OK, so um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Amanda Bull. I am the uh, special, special assistant for planning and science at the Delta Stewardship Council and the coordinator of the Delta Plan Interagency Implementation Committee, also known as DPIC. And uh, we are one of the sponsors or hosts of, of the next two days. Uh, before we dive into the workshop, I just want to mention a few logistics for this virtual format. Um, if you are on your computer, please mute your computer so that there's no interference and background noise, and please turn off your video camera if you're not presenting or speaking. If you're on the phone, please dial star six to mute or unmute yourself. We are recording uh, the discussions in the plenaries, which is so it's just this, this, this section here in the very beginning, but we will not be recording the breakout sessions. Um, we will be taking um, copious notes, so we will be definitely capturing the conversation, but we will not be recording the breakouts. If you have a comment during the plenary or when we reconvene after the breakout sessions, please use the raise, raise hand function to indicate that you have a comment and we will call on you when it's time. You are also welcome to provide written comments via the chat function, which um, we will then read on your behalf. And then um, one other way that you can participate and provide comments, um, if you can't find the raise hand or the chat functions, please email disb at deltacouncil.ca.gov with your comment. And then finally, everyone should have received a couple of links or a few links to their respective breakout sessions. If you do not or can't find those links, um, when we go to break into the breakout sessions, just stay here in the plenary and um, we'll, we'll figure out where you need to go and make sure you, and, and then send you the, the links again. So um, don't worry, we'll, we'll get it all figured out when it's time. Um, so um, here we are at the Science Needs Assessment Workshop. Um, this was originally scheduled for early April or late April, um, but as with so many things with COVID, this got delayed. Um, and so we're meeting, convening now virtually um, over you know two half days. Um, this is an integral piece of the puzzle in um, DPIC and the Delta Independent Science Board's efforts to develop a comprehensive, efficient, coordinated, and well-funded fund, well Delta science enterprise. Um, and Brandon, can you move uh, up a slide, maybe two slides? OK, that one right there. Perfect. Um, so I just want to give you just a, a little, little, little bit of background um, before I hand it over to Steve Brandt, who will provide um, even greater context for our conversations over the next couple of days. Um, in 2018, DPIC launched the Delta Science Funding and Governance Initiative to identify how to adequately fund science in the Delta to support decision making and to build on current efforts that promote coordinated science. And in response to the recommendations that were made in the resulting white paper, the Delta Independent Science Board asked DPIC to conduct a forward-looking science needs assessment. DPIC endorsed three priority actions as part of the implementation report resulting from the Science Funding and Governance Initiative, including the Science Needs Assessment, which is where we are today. And so the conversations that we've been having over Not the sure. last few months and then the conversations we're going to have today and yeah, tomorrow I'm are going to... outside if I get to talk at all. So if you are um, not talking right now, if you could please put yourself on mute. Um, Anyway, so um, the conversations we've been having over the last several months and the conversations you'll all have today and tomorrow are going to be integral into the formation of the science needs assessment. So thank you all very much for being here. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Steve Brandt, um, who's the chair of the Delta Independent Science Board, and he's gonna dive a little bit deeper into why we're here and, and the conversations we'll be having today and tomorrow. Steve? Well, thanks, Amanda. And I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to the workshop and, and uh, Thank you for contributing. It, it is a workshop. We're looking forward to your input, and, and as such, we hope you will be uh, bold and creative and not hold back. And what I'd like to do is, uh, before we start, is to give you a very brief um, description of how we got here. The whole effort was triggered back in February of 2019 when the Delta Independent Science Board sent a memo to DPEC and uh, the title of the memo was Urgency and Opportunities for Improving Delta Interagency Science and Technology Integration. So it really is about uh, how we can uh, develop the science enterprise in a more integrative way to, to really meet the challenges of the future. We pointed out that the environmental conditions are, 
are changing at an ever increasing rate, and that includes uh, climate change, sea level rise, new invasive species, shifts in land use, increasing demands for water, and also that these uh, these uh, drivers are, are uh, interactive. And as such, we suggested that a bolder, forward-looking, and better integrated science program is really needed to address the Delta challenges ahead, which routinely span the mandates of uh, multiple agencies. That would require scientific leadership, identification of science priorities, and I emphasize priorities, and to look at the structures to see if there's any way to improve the interagency science integration. The next slide. Uh, we specifically suggested uh, a science needs assessment <clears throat> as one mechanism to move forward. That would be based on um, fundamental system-wide scientific and management challenges that face the Delta. We suggested one needs to identify future Delta conditions and changes in the fundamental driving forces to identify the science needs to forecast and predict how the Delta might change under these uh, conditions. We suggested that stakeholder engagement is critical to this process and that a multi-agency effort to provide leadership uh, and, and an effective structure for creative scientific and technology technical integration really should be explored. Uh, next slide. We put together about a year ago, a 15 member team shown here, and they've been working over the past year to get this uh, workshop and the actual science needs assessment uh, completed. The next slide. Next slide. And go back one. OK, <clears throat> our progress and timeline is that this uh, eight February or so, we completed a briefing paper. And this briefing paper really describes sort of the rationale for the scientific needs assessment, the various ways that one might go about doing a scientific needs assessment, and dived into some of the specific ideas and uh, mechanisms about the questions that needed to be addressed that really formed the basis of the workshop. As uh, Amanda said that the workshop was um, originally scheduled to be held six months ago and because of COVID we delayed it, but in order to maintain that continuity and momentum, we held four discussion sessions that talked about the various components that, was that were originally scheduled in the workshop. In a parallel effort, the Delta Independent Science Board has been working on a paper on that discusses uh, preparing for a fast forward future in the Delta. I think that paper is part of your background material. And it also discusses other ways to uh, maybe address the forward looking science that one might uh, consider. We're currently at the science needs assessment workshop. We expect to get our uh, final report originally in January of next year. It might uh, be a early of 2021 is probably a better uh, uh, a better forecast. And in that science needs assessment workshop, we would hope to have recommendations specifically to DPEC and also to use that assessment to provide sort of a framework for the science action agenda that many of you have been involved in, in terms of uh, <clears throat> setting the stage for the strategic or longer term priorities that are needed. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> So discussion series were organized into four topics, and many of you have participated in that. The first was to ask the question, what do we know about projected climate change impacts on the Delta? We focused on climate as one of the key changes in drivers because it's reasonably predictable uh, relative to some of the other drivers. So what do we know about the changes that might occur? Secondly, given that, what questions that raise for management decisions? What do managers need to know in that context of a changing uh, ecosystem? And then thirdly, given the management needs, what science needs to be done to give management the answers they need to make those decisions? And then fourthly, given that science uh, priorities, what changes, if any, are needed for the science governance funding and necessary uh, and funding to make that integration possible and to make that science to be done. I'm going to run through these uh, very quickly in the interest of time and uh, the entire uh, discussions have been recorded. They're available for you and we also have uh, reports on each of these as well. OK, the next slide. The first one was uh, headed up by John Calloway, who gave a presentation on climate change impacts for the Delta. 
And then in that, he talked about some of the key mechanisms for Delta climate change, increased air and water temperature, precipitation and, and runoff changes and sea level rise. And some of these are things that uh, the time scale is quite variable. Some of the time things are happening now. Some will happen in the future at a reasonably predictable rate, such as perhaps uh, sea level rise, and some might be surprises. John also emphasized the need to uh, look at the interaction of the other drivers, which are going on at the same time uh, that the climate change drivers are changing, and that we do know have some reasonable confidence in some of the impacts we can already predict with regards to water quality, perhaps habitat and species and human uh, dimensions. The next slide. The second uh, discussion said, what do managers need to know? We had a panel and the panelists indicated uh, a variety of things uh, that, that the community buy-in and support was necessary, that strong science is needed to guide prioritization of funds, that a collaboratively developed overarching set of strategic management questions are required to guide wow. science and that we need to pay particular attention to uncertainties. The next slide. In each of these uh, discussions where we had about 100 participants, we also had a Mentimeter option where we asked the participants uh, answers questions that they could answer in real time. And this is just a summary of some of the answers and that uh, uh, and, and themes that came out. And these themes are often come up as recurrent in all of our discussions. But for this particular management theme, the participants suggested we needed uh, more synthesis. Uh, we need to develop forecasting and prediction tools. We can't forget the synergistic effect of the various changes that are occurring on. We need to prioritize with uh, trade-offs and risks. The social science perspective and, and integration and human dimension is an important component of this, and that we shouldn't forget the idea that we can use experiments derived from management actions in the context of adaptive management. The next slide. The next slide addressed the question of what science is needed, therefore, and Mike is going to uh, talk more about this. And our first breakout session is really uh, focused on this sort of general topic. Sort of the ideas that came out of that discussion was that we needed some strategic research gold, goals. Again, we need to develop and improve tools, forecasting and models. We need a better understanding of ecological processes and, and a mechanistic understanding, particularly with respect to food webs, that uh, management options and analysis of uh, regulation effects is important. Again, we need to look at this uh, social economic impacts and analysis and to do more science that gives us a better idea of what the impacts of climate change might be on the Delta processes. The next slide. The final discussion talked about the need for science governance, funding and integration. Clearly, the panelists thought that uh, coordination was essential to achieve a common goal, that we need to recognize the broader, the broad goals that go beyond regulation and mandated uh, science. Leadership is required within agencies as well as uh, uh, across agencies and better communication between uh, scientists and managers. And the next slide. And the participant input on that topic uh, dealt with uh, some of the challenges with science governance that relate to trust, leadership and institutional structure, reliable sources of funding, and again, a collaborative leadership. This topic will be uh, really explored uh, tomorrow, and it's really the, the primary topic that we're dealing with tomorrow. The next slide. And finally, just to summarize again what our workshop goals are for um, these next two days. The first day we'll be focusing on identifying key science needs, capacity tools that will provide answers and insights for likely management questions under a changing climate with maybe a particular focus on climate as a good example. And then tomorrow we will discuss how how to organize the science enterprise better to address these complex and, and changing problems that may span across different uh, different agencies. And the next slide.
Many of you have been involved in the science action agenda as well, and and uh, to um, and we will have a presentation on that later today. But the way I look at how these two efforts are uh, linked is that the science action agenda, in many respects, focuses on now under current conditions. What do managers need to know now, given our current conditions? The science needs assessment is looking at the future conditions. What do managers need to know given that environmental drivers, drivers and conditions will change? You know this is no time frame on this because some of those changes are occurring right now. So uh, the example I always use is, uh, is considering uh, bass predation on salmon. If you look at it from a, a now perspective, it's what's the impact of current predation rates of bass on salmon populations under current conditions. If you look at it in the future, you could argue that the uh, water temperatures will change, the summer summer will last longer. That very likely will change salmon population levels, it will change bass population levels, likely change the distribution of those two species, and certainly change the predation rates such as uh, uh, energetics and so forth that will impact that relationship of, of uh, of salmon to bass. And that's the kind of forward looking way we're thinking about in terms of this kind of a workshop. Things are gonna change, how will that impact what's gonna happen in the future and how can we get prepared for that? So I think that's uh, that's the end of my brief presentation and I'm gonna uh, dive right into the uh, uh, plenary session. So we just, we've asked three individuals uh, to uh, join us in a plenary session, and their role is to provide inspiration to you all. And uh, we've asked them to, uh, uh, I don't know if it's Peter first, I don't know what the order is, but <clears throat> he's up there. So uh, our three panelists are Peter Goodwin, who's uh, of course professor and current president of the Maryland uh, Center for Environmental Science and formerly the uh, Delta lead scientist. We've asked Felicia uh, Marcus, who's currently the William Landreth Visiting Fellow at Stanford University's Water in the West program and former chair of the State Water Resources Control Board, and Ernest uh, Conant, who's the Mid-Pacific Regional Director of the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. We've asked these uh, plenary speakers to provide uh, inspiration, inform our discussion, get us thinking about these topics creatively, and to talk to us uh, in about five minutes each what your um, advices on developing a science needs policy and how that might be if could be made effective for policymakers. And we will hold questions till all three of them have uh, completed their uh, uh, their words. And we'll start off with uh, Peter since he's on the screen. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the invitation to participate this afternoon. Um, first of all, I just wanted to highlight, as you're very aware, California has a very deep bench fueled by the higher education system uh, that results in uh, very, very uh, deep experience, both in the workforce and amongst our elected officials. And Governor Newsom is continuing this tradition with several strong national statements and actions on a range of issues in the past few months that have been very useful uh, to many other states, including my own. Uh, secondly, there's a very mature and well-connected research community in California that crosses uh, academia, agencies, NGOs, utilities. And there's several examples of this evidence, for example, QEMF and IEP that have had a lot of success. In addition to that, we have the Delta Plan Interagency Implementation Committee, which is an interesting experiment um, as a mechanism for connecting leaders to the science community on specific problems. So all of these factors combine to give a very strong foundation. So what's the problem? So in the next couple of slides, I've tried to draw on the constructive pre-workshop discussions that you've had earlier workshops run by Mike Tchaikovsky and others, and recommendations in earlier National Academy reviews, as well as some experiences elsewhere. So some of the problems here is uh, Phil Eisenberg, of course, the founding chair of the Stewardship Council, 
gave a provocative and very insightful speech to the Aquaterra Conference in the Netherlands in 2009, where he highlighted the different worlds that scientists, managers, and the politicians, the decision makers are in. And the different re reward structures and some of the challenges of bringing these different worlds together. He also emphasized that talk, which went out to government ministers, um, national research centers around the world that was focusing on vulnerable coastlines um, around the world. And it, as part of that talk, he also captured the importance of setting tractable problems. Secondly, uh, as you're all too aware, uh, and why the science is so difficult, we're in a highly dynamic and complex system. And the Stewardship Council report, you know, complicated, uh, complex or cantankerous, you captured that extremely well. And also the Delta Stewardship Council, if you recall Patrick Johnson uh, in the original science plan, uh, in his inimitable gentle way, came out with one of his one-liners that really captured the challenge of connecting the science community uh, to problems. And his comment about the monks of science, uh, as you could see there, was uh, extremely insightful. But the reality is in such a complex system, if we're going to make meaningful progress, bold landscape scale decisions need to be taken. And these decisions have inherent risks. So if you're the head of a utility, the director of an agency, a secretary, one bad outcome from these very large decisions can literally be career ending, unless these decisions have the backing of the science community. So often the time frame for science and these management decisions are simply not compatible. And a classic example of this was the placement of the Delta barriers during the drought. A decision had to be made the following week. The complexity of the situation, the hydrodynamics and all of the other ancillary issues uh, were just extremely complex. So what are the elements of actionable science? On the right there, I captured a, a, a statement by E.O. Wilson in his 1978 text. First of all, we've got diverse data coming from multiple sources. And this is just expanding every day. So how can we pull that information together? The second thing, and as is built in California, the principles of the science has to be credible, peer reviewed. It has to be legitimate, all relevant parties at the table. It has to be relevant, answering the questions. It has to be timely and transparent. So just as one example from outside of success, in the state of Maryland, by state statute, there's a Bay Cabinet, which includes the secretaries, directors of the agencies, and includes the vice chancellor and president uh, of the University System of Maryland. This group meets extremely regularly, and it's a great way for communicating and anticipating the issues that come up. The second element, and again to cite John Weens uh, at an ISB meeting, he posed the question, when is good science good enough? Good enough to make decisions. And this was echoed by then director Mark Cowan, who asked, not, don't just give me a number about these issues or a scenario. If I'm going to make these decisions, I need to understand the risks associated with it, and I need the uncertainty quantified. And so to get there, there's many ways. The traditional peer-reviewed science panels are the gold standard, and of course the science program does this exceptionally well. But there's other methods too. You know, for example, uh, over-the-shoulder uh, science board reviews have been used very successfully in Louisiana. Small groups of some of the top scientists in the country sitting down with agency folks. So when this comes back into the public arena, there's a very deep understanding of the challenges and uncertainties. And the last two here are science conversation or sounding boards, informal gatherings of science with agency leaders, a free flowing exchange of ideas. And this exchange goes in both directions. And I think this surprised us a few years ago. One of the most respected estuarine ecologists in the world who's just joined the ISB made the comment 
how this exchange really helped him think about his own research program and those people that he supervised. So to throw out uh, a big idea, I wanted to just highlight, uh, of course, the importance of stable funding. What we saw a few years ago, without that, the experts in the universities and agencies, the soft money people, disperse. And in order to keep that brain trust alive, to sustain the Science Follows program is extremely important. And in today's world, this is a wonderful way to begin to address structural racism through diversifying the workforce. So assigning some of those science fellow scholarships uh, to ensure that some of our scientists reflect the face of the communities that they serve to build trust. And there's some great ideas around this big idea. The National Science Foundation has NCS that we're all familiar with, so SYNC, uh, that we run over here in Maryland. The USGS has a wonderful center in Colorado, NOAA, and many others. So um, these programs also have the success of ensuring networking across agency organization boundaries. And if we could go to the next slide. This allows these big wicked problems, the, the kinds of problems that take a really long-term view that cannot be addressed by a single agency or a single consortium of universities or research centers, and can address the chaotic socio-environmental problems. What this means is that you can start with the same initial conditions, the same boundary forcing, and you can get different outcomes. And this is why we need the continuous monitoring, the continuous updating of our predictive models. But if we were to create a center an innovation science refuge, a neutral space where ideas could be exchanged. This would not supplant agency expertise or resources that we must have um, held within each of the agencies, but it uses enabling technology to facilitate collaboration, access multiple models from different sources and conduct the data synthesis that the National Academies has highlighted. So the next slide, please. And so what would this enable us to do? This center, high-tech center, allowing inter-exchange of models and data and information. First of all, it solves the Eisenberg dilemma, solving practicable problems in the same world, where these problems are identified by DPEC and the structure and process designed by the Stewardship Council and the Science Program. It also solves the Johnson dilemma, of bringing leading science experts directly to the nature of the decision that needs to be made. And finally, it solves the agency leaders dilemma that if the best science, the best data, the various data sources can be pulled together, that can be structured in a way that majority and minority opinions can be clearly articulated, the risk can be calculated along with the analysis. And also this allows concise, clear communications of the findings to back the agency leader's decision. So with that, thanks for your attention and I'll pass it back to Dr. Brent. Well, thanks much, uh, Peter. As always, uh, uh, we could spend days talking about your last two slides. Uh, let's uh, move on. Uh, Alicia, are you ready to go? Yeah. I've I think you should be able to see me. I can't see me, but I've see you. Yes. good, perfect. Well, that was fabulous. Um, and I particularly like the idea of an innovative science refuge that I'm ready to go there and support that program in a moment. Um, we all need it and uh, you need it most of all. I'm really happy to join you all and to be able to join Peter and Ernest on this panel to start up what I think is going to be a really important series of sessions as we look back on it in the years to come. You know, I know a lot of you from the my Delta Stewardship Council and Waterboard days, as well as before that, and admire many of you that I don't yet know uh, personally. So it's been really great to see your names, if not your faces on this screen. I hope later in the, the day to be able to see your faces too. Um, I've taken a break from the Bay Delta over the past year and a half. So it really uh, becomes pretty nice. A couple of exceptions. I really know that a lot of you some of you I've known for 30 years. I've been labor, laboring long and hard over how not just how to do the great science work 
that you do, but how to do it in a way that will make it matter, uh, not just to policymakers, but for the people of California. And it's interesting how often over the years I've gone to enclaves between scientists and policymakers to figure out how to integrate our missions, our choice of language, and how to understand each other. It's almost like a constant uh, encounter series of sessions that we need to do. And I, I think that's worth the time because we need each other desperately. Um, and yet there's always a need to bridge divides, divides in language, divides in time scales, uh, divides in the need for certainty. And I, I've spent countless hours and days uh, starting long ago my work on Santa Monica Bay and through myriad policy workshops at the Delta Council and the State Board, the CSAMP meetings, and the Delta Science and Policy conferences. And I reviewed the materials from the workshops you've already had in this series, and they look really good and really productive. Um, I think the key in all of it, and you won't be surprised to hear me say this, is to acknowledge our different worlds in coming at these issues and our different languages so we can find a way to honor each other's roles and our differences with respect and compassion. And it doesn't just happen. It's something you have to work out. And I know I say all the time that we have to devote ourselves not just to the complexities of the science or the policy or the legal frameworks, but to what I always call the challenge of ego system management, not ecosystem management, but ego system management. And I'm not talking about big egos, which people always go to. I'm just talking about focusing on the people in the human ecosystem that we're working in to try and make things happen. Um, it's just true. And it's really easy to forget as we get passionate about our particular roles and the tasks we or others have put in front of us. So I just salute you for coming together today and throughout this process to keep trying. It's really never been so important. I'm going to give you six thoughts quickly of why I think it's so important and then seven of you know, what could be 30 things um, that it's important to bear in mind as we move forward in this work. So why is it so important? Well, number one, we're behind the eight ball in the Delta ecosystem to begin with, and it just keeps getting worse. Uh, two, it's a complex system that's not run as a system. With it's, it's run with tools that are bathed in combat and conflict since time immemorial. It's, it's almost like a sport or a debating society rather than the kind of intentional management of complex systems that frankly does happen in some other parts of the country and some other parts of the world. So it's really hard for science to penetrate to the level where we can have the discussions we really need to have to deal with uncertainty and taking action based on probabilities. Three, in the absence of certainty, which is guaranteed that there is no certainty, folks pick and choose the science they want to rely on and tend to believe that which is most comfortable to believe. The science that's convenient to believe, the science that fits into a pre-existing belief system. That's just human, that's not evil. That's just what we all do in a complex world without the, the tools or a, um, a framework or something to help us see it another way. Fourth, most important probably, as climate change makes it all even harder to predict than it was in the in the last thing. I, I love that E.O. Wilson quote that Peter used. I, of course, always go to Yogi Berra, which is, you know, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Um, it's just hard to do in any uh, instinct, but in any kind of situation. But with climate change, the past as a predictor of the future really goes out the window and opens an even bigger um, window for those who want to choose combat overcoming together to solve joint problems. So understand and own the consequences of what you say because you know what you say can be weaponized. And it has been. So climate change can be the great force that unites us all to come together to meet a joint threat, or it can be the giant sucking sound that pulls people apart into being opportunist to say that because it's gonna be even harder to save salmon, for example, in 30 years, why bother now? Ditto with the, the amazing people and landscape of the Delta. And we just can't do that. Uh, but there's a pull to do that that we see taking advantage of it. In the absence of coming up with an articulable way of saying how we can meet the climate challenge in a way that actually is better for everyone, which I believe is true, 
but that voice has to come out from more than a policymaker's voice or a political person's voice, um, I think we can leaven that and sort of um, empower those who want to actually do things going forward and disempower the talking class, which is kind of the way I look at a lot of what um, we tried to do during my term at the water board. Fifth, and you've talked about this a bit, uh, there is a big difference between resilience and sustainability. Sustainability is important. Been around, people have talked about it. It's a question of being more efficient with resources in the in the uh, production and manufacturing economy. The use of the world circular economy is big. I'm old enough uh, to have been around since the beginning of the recycling days, and there are different tags that become important to help people talk about the same stuff kind of going forward. I think resilience is fundamentally different because now not only do we have to deal with a greater level of uncertainty, we need to deal with huge disruptions that go outside the norms of our typical exceedance plots or our typical historical understanding. And I think that can be a little bit scary, but I think it also can be used as the clarion call for people coming together to uh, hope for the best, but plan for the worst. And I also, I'll get to why uh, the thing I think this can help us the most with. Um, and then six, other places and other countries, and I spent a lot of time on this last year traveling all over the world, speaking and learning and um, connecting with people dealing with climate adaptation and water in uh, the global fora, let alone in individual places. Um, and it, everybody's struggling with this issue. They're struggling with it in Australia as they figure out how to, how to deal with changing and unpredictable um, circumstances coming out of climate change that their very uh, uh, concrete and constructed model of how to deal with their water rights system and their ecosystem restoration is built on. And they have a history of science at a national level with their CSIRO. You know, they are a culture that has focused on science, respects experts, and expects government to actually plan systemically. I mean, they've gone back and forth from time to time, of course, and politics is just as virulent there as it is anywhere else. But they are struggling with figuring out how to deal with the implications of climate change, but it's a good struggle to have. So what do we need to do? Number one, I think we need to focus on scenarios, even outside the usual exceedance charts we usually use, that it took me so long to figure out how to read, uh, and that gets back to the how to communicate. Uh, we're going to need not only plan B's, but plan C's and D's. We're going to have to, the shape of our charts on potential paths are going to have to change because uh, we're going to be, you know, riding a Bronco, uh, Buck and Bronco through this. Two, we actually need to be as concrete as we can about the kinds of actions that can help the estuary and its species be more, res and its people be more resilient over time and handle disruption. And that's why habitat restoration coupled with greater flows can help buffer the temperature and drought issues we know are going to become more intense. It is a moment to be able to talk about nature-based nature -based solutions, not just letting nature go its course in an altered system, but actually fundamentally figuring out how to have nature-based solutions work for us. Because nature is designed to buffer varying circumstances and uncertainty. There is actually an argument for how we need to be more intentional about intentionally managing flows, habitat restoration and the like in order to all get better together, as it were, people and um, uh, uh, water users and the environment. But it requires us being able to be intentional about it and come together. At the same time, number three, we do need to do a much better job explaining why flows are important from the tribs all the way out to the ocean. We haven't really done that well enough yet. You know, I see plenty of scientists and all the surveys talking about, oh, yes, this is important. And the surveys, um, they're saying that if you if you look at partisans on one side, they'll say it's habitat. You look at partisans on the other side, they'll say it's flow. But if you actually um, talk to the bulk of scientists, they'll say flow is that master variable. Some of that work has come from the Delta Council, some from PPIC years ago. Um, but again, we need to be more as concrete as we can about the interactions. We understand them. I finally understood them far better at the state board and trusted uh, the scientists both from the Delta Council outside and my own staff, but we still haven't explained that as well as we should. Fourth, we have to do that, though, 
while really being sure we don't fall into or play into the it's all flow or it's all habitat memes that partisans can call, fall into. This is to me where scientists doing really good work and spending time on communicating it out to the public and policymakers is more important. It sounds like you've discussed that. Five, so do the good science we know you can do and then put aside the time to talk about it in both scientific and lay language. Set aside time for multiple conversations and multiple convenings. The Science Enterprise Workshop a few years ago was an awesome example, as is this process, but keep adding smaller convenings and briefings to the mix. Do some of them in the legislature as well. Zoom the heck out of all the work that you do. Uh, six, push back when your folks use your work in a way that seems like combat science. You don't need to be political to do this. Just clarify what your work does and doesn't say in public and in the fora where you see it be, being mischaracterized. You host the fora to make sure it doesn't happen. And perhaps most important, as I've said to you many times, find a way to communicate what you know in a way that acknowledges what you don't, in a way that helps policies make the, policymakers make the choices they need to make. More study is always needed. Don't lead with that. We know that. But action needs to be taken before all is lost. So help policy makers make some of the right choices by making your work intelligible beyond the inner circle. You know, blessed are the translators. So with that, I'm looking forward to the breakouts, uh, looking forward to spending more of the day with you. And, and most importantly, thank you for all the work you do day in and out. You know, there are always going to be angels and opportunists out there. And most people think they're the former even as they act as the latter. So your work lays the foundation for all of us to bring out our true inner angels and have the opportunity for us to be able to move forward in a constructive way with each other. So thanks, looking forward to the day. Thanks very much, Felicia. Again, another whole series of really good ideas and uh, I'm glad we're recording this because I can't take notes that fast. <laughs> and uh, Ernest. Thank you, Steve. And, uh... I don't know if this is going to be particularly inspirational, but uh, I do want to thank you for the opportunity to provide a few remarks today. And uh, I appreciate the uh, proactive uh, letter uh, from the Delta Independent Science Board from last year. Um, and I appreciate the efforts of Susan and members of the Delta Plan Interagency Implementation Committee uh, on how we can best prepare for the future. Uh, we have a lot of challenges facing operation of the Central Valley Project, as you can well imagine, um, and our efforts in the Delta. Um, I'm a lawyer by training and experience. I understand agreements and contracts and mechanisms to uh, clearly define our institutional arrangements, uh, but I rely on conversations with our technical staff and on information from you to help us make informed decisions. Uh, we uh, are in need of uh, the scientific com community to provide clear information. Uh, we need the, you to work together. Together includes along with our uh, partner federal and state and local agencies. Um, and please find ways to support each other uh, in considering diverse opinions and alternative perspectives. So. Uh, please fi uh, find ways to evaluate different approaches and have dialogue that makes it safe to try new ideas and encourage innovation. There's a lot of energy that's spent on conflict. We uh, could accomplish much more by spending that energy working together. So let's work on a framework that is independent of any agency or group and allows for reasonable differences between reasonable people. Uh, this framework, the, the, this framework by DPIC is an example of uh, open information sharing and reliance on collaboration. Uh, my staff uh, talks to me about the need to develop robust metrics of multi-species ecological functions. Uh, for example, we need to know what algae we're growing and whether it's good, poor, or harmful. Uh, we need to know what eats the algae. We need to know what eats what eats the algae. 
just to name a few. So um, combining monitoring with models helps us to predict trade-offs. Um, please think about where our tools work well and where we need new ones. And I ask that you uh, work with my staff to uh, boil it down and clearly explain potential consequences of different options. Um, and so I'm here to learn. Uh, my staff is here to help. Um, I look forward to what our scientists can come up with. Uh, and uh, please know that you have a, a partner in collaboration with Reclamation. So with that, I'll leave it there and um, I think we're open to any questions for a short period of time. <laughs> well, I, I certainly want to thank uh, all of our panelists. Uh, you, you've given us so much information and uh, insight and ideas, and and uh, I think your inspiration will really help us uh, along in this workshop. And in fact, I, I see a lot of your comments uh, melding into a lot of our discussions for the next two days. I really think that you've set the stage for that, and I really appreciate it. I don't know if there's any questions. I know um, I, I've heard uh, quotes from uh, Yogi Berra and John Weens. Uh, the person I quote most often being from Wisconsin is Vince Lombardi, of course, uh, <laughs> who's uh, one of his quotes is, um, we didn't lose the game, we just ran out of time. And <laughs> we might have run out of time here. Uh, so um, is that, Edmund, are we okay with some extra questions? Do we have anything or should we move on? Or Amanda. I think we should actually move on. Maybe if folks want to put some questions on the side and if we have some spare time later in the morning, we can or late in the afternoon, we can okay. um, do it. But let's uh, maybe move on to the next next section. And I'm sure they'll take uh, written questions and be happy to provide written answers in the future. So uh, sure. <laughs> I'm saying that jokingly. I would do that. <laughs> I, I oh. miss everybody, so I'm a nerd. All right. Uh, um, be glad to. Okay, we're going to move on, and our, our next presentation is by Rachel uh, Kloffenstein, who's with the science program, and she's going to give us about a 10-minute presentation on delving into the uh, science action agenda and what they're up to. They just had a, a management workshop uh, last week, so uh, Rachel, are you available? I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Rachel Kloffenstein. I'm a senior environmental scientist uh, with the Delta Sturcher Council's Delta Science Program. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present briefly today. Um, this was that was a really great panel discussion. Very tough act to follow, but I'm excited to have a few moments of your time. And I was asked to help address the question of what will managers and stakeholders need to know, um, given what we know about climate and rapid environmental change. So in order to help answer that question, I'm actually going to first discuss a different but related effort than the science needs assessment, rather the science action agenda. Next slide. But before diving into the science action agenda, I just want to reiterate that these efforts are complementary and progressing simultaneously, as Steve mentioned earlier. Um, and the, the image here is just a screenshot from the advanced briefing paper displaying the different uh, documents produced by the Delta Science Program with the addition of the science needs assessment. So focusing on the science action agenda, the blue document there, um, it focuses on the science needed now to address immediate management needs and to reduce uncertainties in decision making, whereas the science needs assessment will look beyond our near term efforts towards future science needs and opportunities. And the recommendation to develop a more forward looking science strategy and horizon scanning um, was identified by the Delta Independent Science Board through the Science Funding and Governance Initiative, as we heard about before. Um, but also in response to the development of the 2019 Delta Science Plan um, and as it relates to the current science action agenda. So we are really excited to see both the science needs assessment and the science action agenda update efforts progressing um, to ensure an effective and responsive forward-looking science strategy for the Delta. Next slide, please. At its core, the science action agenda prioritizes and aligns science actions to meet management needs. It can be thought of as identifying the gaps in the glue. What are current gaps in knowledge and what science actions need to occur to address these knowledge gaps? And it's updated on a four to five year time scale. The science action agenda provides the Delta Science Program and our partners with a collaboratively developed agenda to guide funding decisions, science planning, and much more. 
And the science action agenda has come up multiple times during the science needs assessment discussions. For example, in discussion two, when uh, Jennifer Pierre recognized the importance of having a collaborative and agreed upon list of management questions. I'll get to that in a minute. And again, in discussion four, when Carl Wilcox noted that the science action agenda helps to set the broader context for what science needs to be done overall across the enterprise, again, in the more near term. And so we're currently working to update the science action agenda for 2022 to 2026. And in order to ensure the update process is collaborative, transparent, and robust, uh, the process has already started and we're seeking input early and often. Next slide. The science action agenda will include management needs and science actions, as did the previous or current iteration. But this time we're starting with a broad list of management questions to better ensure that science actions inform and are relevant to policy and management. And this approach, again, is being taken in response to priority actions recommended in the uh, 2019 Delta Science Funding and Governance Initiative, which was facilitated and endorsed by the Delta Plan Interagency Implementation Committee, or DPIC, and which also helped lead to this science needs assessment effort. As defined, management questions target uncertainty around a given management action or topic, tend to be specific to a single agency or set of agencies or organizations, but do generally have enterprise-wide application and when answered, provide information that will inform management needs. And this kind of tiered graphic here just shows how management questions fit under broader management needs and connect to the science actions. Beginning in March of this year, we started to compile this list of management questions and have received tremendous input. Uh, we, we have engaged with nearly 30 collaborative groups across the Delta and reviewed about that many documents. So uh, examples are like the IEP science strategy, the water resilience portfolio. And then we also released a survey online and presented to both DPIC and the Delta Stewardship Council. And we uh, formed an advisory committee of participants from the Science Funding and Governance Initiative to help us along in our process. Throughout all this, managers, scientists, and stakeholders submitted nearly 1,280 management questions, which we see as uh, an indication of the value and support for this management question effort and the overall update to the science action agenda. After screening, merging, and organizing questions into themes, 1,181 management questions were brought to a workshop last week. Next slide. And I'm just gonna briefly mention the um, workshop itself. But the purpose of last week's workshop was, which included uh, breakout sessions, was to facilitate collaborative and consensus-based discussion of the list of management questions organized by a management theme. And given the sheer number of management questions, we distributed a the full list um, for input before uh, the workshop via an online survey just to help streamline the discussions. And after we incorporate the feedback, we have our well, we have our work cut out for ourselves there. After we incorporate the feedback and circulate the list of uh, questions for additional review and input, our plan is to post a manageable short list of top Delta management questions around the order so of 100 um, later this fall. And then a subset of these top questions will be selected for incorporation into the 2022 to 2026 science action agenda. Next slide. Moving forward, the Delta Science program will post the top list of Delta management questions later this fall and um, will make the master sheet of all those 1200 ish questions and how they evolved or changed um, as we'll make that available as well. And then just shown here in the timeline in blue, um, we will continue with the next steps of developing the management question or sorry, management needs and identifying science actions before drafting the next full science action agenda for public reviews, including by the Delta Independent Science Board. And at this stage, we really look forward to the science needs assessment being made available early next year to help inform the scoping of the science actions to address the near term management needs identified. Next slide. Thinking back to what will managers need to know, uh, we kept in mind the science needs assessment when reviewing the list of management questions submitted for the science action agenda effort and noted which questions specifically, <clears throat> excuse me, mentioned climate change, rapid environmental change, or other forward looking questions and uncertainties, identifying about 90. And these questions spanned across all nine different management themes that we used for organizing the management questions, which were the eight from the monitoring enterprise review or the, and the science needs assessment briefing paper, 
but we also added kind of a catch-all science governance uh, theme and we had to do some merging and splitting up of larger ones. Next slide. And many of the common um, themes and topics in the 90 or so questions included topics discussed in the science needs assessment advanced briefing paper in webinars uh, or the, the discussion seminars one and two. And I'm just going to run through some examples. So questions addressed how are communities in the Delta vulnerable and resilient to climate changes? What are appropriate and equitable adaptation strategies? How will climate change impact agricultural practices and crop mixes in the Delta or land use and ecosystem services? Many questions also considered how climate change and sea level rise will affect habitats, especially in the context of um, restored tidal wetlands and their ecosystem functions. Questions asked how climate change will impact the spread of invasive species, as well as our control and management practices. Impacts to native species, particularly listed species, uh, from flow and temperature changes were also mentioned. And um, many, many questions asked how can we improve forecasting and predictions uh, for management actions. This was brought up earlier in some of the, the uh, seminar, or, sorry, the um, panel discussions, as well as how to uh, better integrate and expand the capabilities of modeling and monitoring given future changes. What are the vulnerabilities to extreme events and climate change impacts to water operations and storage? And then changes to nutrient and contaminant loadings and their impacts to water quality were also mentioned as well as how climate change will affect the impact and frequency of harmful algal blooms. Next slide. And based on the pre-workshop survey that I mentioned for the Science Action Agenda workshop, we've listed here the top three climate change related questions from our initial list. So they've likely changed a little bit since, you know, for example, um, what are the effects of climate change on species, delta ecology and potential impacts on water and natural resource management? That was an example question. And it's worth noting also that these three questions were also in the top five highest rated management questions overall. So according to the 50 plus survey responses we had for the science action agenda workshop, these questions rose to the top out of the 1100 or so management questions. And I think this you know, kind of clearly shows that um, these climate change related questions are on the minds of managers, scientists, and stakeholders, just highlighting the importance of thinking about how to respond now and prepare for future and more rapid changes in the Delta. Um, so again, really excited that this science needs assessment effort is, is progressing. And with that, I think I'm going to end there and I'm happy to take any questions before turning it over to Mike. Next slide. No, no. okay. okay. Um, why don't we move on to the next slide, Brandon? Uh, maybe the next one after that. OK, great. So uh, we've got about 10 minutes, uh, and the primary uh, purpose of this segment is to uh, transition everyone to the main event this afternoon, which is the breakout groups. Uh, I'm Mike Chukowski, uh, the southwestern region of the US Geological Survey, and I'd like to um, review uh, the um, reason why we're here again, uh, and I'm going to say a few things that overlap with uh, what Rachel and Steve said, just to emphasize uh, what we're looking for in this uh, science needs assessment. And then I'd like to um, briefly go over the uh, the uh, remarks and uh, questions that were raised at the July 28th uh, pre-workshop seminar, which was about uh, science needs, future science needs. Uh, and last, I'd like to just talk about the mechanics of uh, what we're going to be doing in the breakouts. So uh, to reiterate, um, the, Steve showed this slide earlier. Um, I, th I think this captures uh, in, in a pretty important way what we're doing in the science needs assessment that's different from the science action agenda. Uh, these bars represent uh, science needs, not science. So when you look at these, the science action agenda reflects science needs that we can articulate right now. So there are uh, needs that are formulated with the knowledge of what the various uh, managers and policy makers need to be doing right now uh, and uh, in the environmental conditions that we are experiencing right now. 
as we see it, uh, the farther you go into the future, the less specific you'll be able to be uh, in identifying specific disciplinary need, uh, science needs that managers and policymakers will have. But um, we do know that things are going to change. Uh, the climate's changing around us uh, at, at, at right now. Um, there are other changes occurring. There are social changes, geographical changes that are occurring. Uh, and as such, uh, well, it's hard to pin down specific studies that we might want to do in the future. Uh, we can, if we think about it, uh, consider what managers will be faced with in the future. And in the science needs assessment, uh, we're trying to put ourselves in the shoes of decision makers somewhere down the road uh, when conditions have changed. Uh, the environmental drivers are potentially different. The society that we live in has potentially evolved in terms of population abundance, water needs, et cetera. And we will ask ourselves whether there are things that we could be doing now in order to get ready for that future. Uh, next slide, Brandon. So on July 28th, uh, we had a, a pre-workshop uh, seminar on this topic. And uh, we there were three, as Steve said, three uh, panelists. Uh, the panelists, uh, when, when considering this the future with um, different conditions, um, uh, said a number of things that were in common with one another, as well as some other things that, that were one-offs from the panelists. Um, this, uh, there's a summary of this in the, in the, in the, uh, in the um, informational sheet that, that uh, everyone received for, for breakout number one. But things that we said uh, that were generally in common included, one, uh, the observation that uh, in the future we're going to have to uh, pay more attention to ensuring that we have a, a science infrastructure that's adequate to support and deliver the large volumes of data that we're, uh, that we're collecting now and will be collecting an increasing volume going forward. Uh, uh, as you know, we have a magnificent uh, uh, record, a uh, monitoring record of this uh, estuary. Uh, but uh, what we've seen recently is that as technologies have improved, particularly with respect to remote sensing, uh, we're collecting um, increasingly vast quantities of data. And my understanding is that as of now, we're collecting uh, terabytes per day of data. And we, we need to consider how we're going to house all that data and serve all that data to make sure that it's actually available to the technical staffs uh, and managers that are going to need to rely on it in the future. Second, uh, we all agreed that we're going to need to maintain and refine our long-term monitoring, and we're going to need to do that bearing in mind that we're going to be relying increasingly on environmental models going forward for various purposes. One for forecasting, another to uh, improve our understanding of how the system works. And that monitoring is going to provide us with essential and irreplaceable information about uh, conditions uh, as we progress going forward. So the loss of uh, monitoring capabilities is was regarded by all three of us as, uh, as something that we really uh, we really should avoid if we want to uh, do a good job of informing decisions in the future. Another is that um, we all agree that we need to have a, a much deeper understanding of the underlying processes that drive Delta ecosystems. Uh, and, and this um, requires uh, not only the direct study of those processes, but also the sort of synthesis that Steve was referring to in his uh, introduction. Uh, we, need to, we need to know how the system works. We also need it. We also identified a need to uh, have uh, to develop improved tools uh, to bridge the divide between uh, scientists and managers. Um, one of the um, characteristics of useful applied science uh, that um, we've all heard uh, described is that good science for management is science that's usable by managers, not necessarily just useful, but something they can actually use. And uh, we, I'm not going to go into detail in this right here because we don't have the time. But um, we, we, this, this, the panel on the 28th agreed that we, we, we need to, we need to uh, increase the focus on the development of tools that will help us to inform uh, managers and 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 uh, and to make that uh, any easier to do. Uh, 
And last, uh, we all agreed that we need to uh, increase the coordination really among entities, not just between agencies, uh, in order to uh, increase the reach of the science enterprise. Um, we already do a lot of coordination, but uh, it uh, was generally agreed that we could do a better job of that, and that will help us be more efficient and to uh, and to accomplish goals that we might not be able to accomplish uh, operating individually. So the next slide, Brandon. So the participants um, actually provided a lot of interesting comments and I, I would uh, urge you to, to read the sheet um, to get a sense of what those are. And I think we have a background document that actually includes verbatim the questions that were asked. Um, participants, um, emphasized uh, some of the same themes that the panel did, um, the development uh, uh, and improvement of tools, uh, particularly forecasting tools and integrated environmental models, uh, as well as uh, the, um, the development of better data infrastructure. And participants agreed with us, uh, agreed with the panel that um, having a better understanding of uh, the ecological processes that underlie the responses of the estuary to management actions is, is essential. We've made progress, but we need to make more. Uh, we particularly, as Steve said, need to better understand uh, how food webs operate uh, and what, uh, what, drivers, uh, uh, what drivers affect them and in what ways. And we need to do all those things in part because, uh, and this is an important matter here in California, we need to understand the long-term effects of climate change and how, uh, how best uh, managers can address the challenges that that is going to continue to create. So um, a couple of uh, other things participants provided uh, us that I want to relate just uh, as background for the breakout. Um, one, we had um, some interest in, uh, in uh, a better understanding of uh, how we address management options and how we analyze regulatory effects. Um, those are clearly things that are, that are going, going to matter to uh, the action agencies. Uh, we need to do a better job of addressing uh, social science issues uh, than we have historically, economics, geography, and uh, uh, other issues that are related to the uh, that human uses of uh, particularly of Delta lands. And we need to uh, understand uh, very specifically what the impacts of climate change are going to be on Delta processes, particularly those that affect water operations, uh, because those are, uh, those are uh, obviously going to carry on in, into the indefinite future. Next slide, Brandon. So uh, the breakout this afternoon is going to allow um, all of the participants here to um, weigh in on some questions that we formulated uh, after the July 28th event uh, that we think will allow us to focus on productive areas of discussion. And we're breaking it out into these eight uh, uh, subsessions. Uh, everyone should have received a uh, uh, a uh, 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 an address, a URL to go to uh, the Teams meeting for uh, the the subsession to which they're assigned. Uh, if you don't have one, uh, then uh, I, as Amanda said at the beginning, um, please hang around in the in the plenary room, this room, and either raise your hand or type something into the the chat window, and we'll try and hook you up with uh, an appropriate uh, or the uh, subsession that, that you were intended intending to go to. Um, we're going to be in those chat rooms and you will be working with the uh, with the, the chat facilitators or the discussion facilitators until uh, I believe 3.40 p.m. Um, we're we're only slightly behind schedule actually at this point. So uh, I believe we're starting at uh, 2.25 and um, this will when we um, sign off from this discussion in a moment, um, this will give you a chance to go uh, get another cup of coffee or uh, take a break. Uh, and then you should, um, I would suggest pretty quickly, make sure that you actually can get into the, the, um, the Teams room that, that you're gonna be in for, these, for the discussion. And I will provide um, one uh, additional um, suggestion before you go. Um, Brandon, next slide. Uh, actually skip over this one. 
Uh, and that is that um, you keep an open mind uh, while you're having this um, discussion about uh, the future of science. Uh, in particular, um, it's not too early to, to be thinking about how we, the means by which we might achieve the, the goals that you'll be discussing this afternoon. So while you're in there and, and you're discussing uh, flood management or whatever it is that you're, you're whatever room you're gonna be in, ask yourself whether uh, reaching the um, the goals that we're trying to reach in terms of providing um, good economical advice to managers from the science perspective might entail um, any of this any of these bullets for example uh, improvements in the way we recruit uh, or train scientists and engage managers uh, refinements to the membership or leadership structure of our science organizations I imagine some people will have specific thoughts about that um, Imagine whether we need to think about changes in the way we award research funding uh, to make sure we have the right people, the right scientists uh, working on crucial projects and to ensure accountability so that um, we actually are producing usable science, uh, not just useful science and potentially changes at the science management boundary uh, that we might uh, want to try to uh, achieve that would help us improve two-way communication back and forth between uh, managers and policymakers and the science community. So all of those are things that we potentially will be able to work on um, going forward. And depending on the, the dialogue that we have in these subgroups, we may conclude that that some of these are really important to, uh, to, to think about doing if we want to um, be prepared for the future. So at this point, um, uh, I think you're going to get advised, by the way, at the bottom of the slide, it says to come back at 3.40, but I think your, uh, your facilitators will, uh, will manage that and get you back here. Uh, so at this point, um, uh, everyone who already has the link to the proper subroom should drop out of this room uh, and go to their subroom and then make sure you can get in there and then you can take a break until uh, 2.25. Uh, again, if you have a problem with that, um, if you don't have it, stay here, uh, raise your hand or talk in chat or come back here if you have trouble getting in. So we'll see you in the chat in the uh, in the in the breakout rooms. Peter, it's really good to see you, too, by the way.